Hello, everyone, and welcome to the January 2024 presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I am Ben Woodbury with the Friends of History and will serve as your host today. These monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with the support from the New Mexico History Museum and from donations from our audience. Today, we are happy to once again welcome Dr. William Billy Kaiser, Associate Professor of History and Department Chair at Texas A&M University, San Antonio. Billy is originally from Las Vegas and graduated New Mexico State University before going on to earn his doctorate in history at Arizona State University in 2016. He's the author of five books on 19th century borderlands history in and around Mexi New Mexico. His books include Turmoil on the Rio Grande, published in 2011, Dragoons in Apache Land, published in 2013, and Borderlands of Slavery, published in 2017. In 2019, he presented a very popular talk on his fourth book, Coast to Coast Empire, Manifest Destiny and the New Mexico Borderlands, uh, to the Friends of History. Today, he will speak on his most recent book, Illusions of Empire, which was published this year. He has one more book uh, in the works, and that will be published by Yale University Press and examines Indian scalp bounties and scalp warfare across the North American frontiers from the 1600s to the 1800s. Illusions of Empire, on which he speaks today, adopts a multinational view of the southwestern U.S. borderlands during our Civil War, examining the ways in which Mexico's north overlapped with the U.S. Southwest in the context of diplomacy, politics, economics, and military operations. So let us now welcome Billy Kaiser. Thank you, Ben, for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. And it really is a pleasure to be back here with you all today. I have uh, very fond memories of my trip to Santa Fe about four years ago. And, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to, uh, to speak to the Friends of New Mexico History again today. Um, I want to begin my talk, which will eventually focus very specifically on New Mexico and Northwestern Mexico during the Civil War. Um, but I want to begin with a little bit of background on the Civil War and the role of Mexico in the American Civil War. So my talk today is titled Civil War Diplomacy in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. And the book covers the entire U.S.-Mexico border from California to Texas and on the Mexican side from Baja, California to Tamaulipas. So it's a very broad, expansive coverage of the Civil War era uh, and diplomatic relations um, in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. But, uh, but again, today I'm going to focus really specifically on um, southern New Mexico and northwestern Mexico. Now, when, when people think about the Civil War, uh, one of the, I would imagine that very few people would think about Mexico. I mean, people might think of, uh, of the big battles, Gettysburg, Antietam, Shiloh. They might think of Abraham Lincoln. They might think of, of slavery and emancipation. There are, are, are many sort of paradigmatic um, uh, events and people associated with the Civil War. But very rarely would anybody immediately think of Mexico if, uh, if they were thinking of the Civil War. And yet one of the main points of my book and the point that I really um, hope to, to make today in this talk is that Mexico did figure quite prominently in the American Civil War in a variety of ways. And to illustrate that point, I'm going to begin by just kind of giving an overview of the very earliest days of the Civil War and how some of the highest level figures in both the Union and the Confederacy were thinking about Mexico in a strategic way as the Civil War uh, began. So I here I, I have uh, photos of Robert Toombs, who was the Confederate Secretary of State when the war began, and William Henry Seward, who was the, the U.S. Reunion Secretary of State. So both of these men um, uh, at the highest levels in charge of international relations and diplomacy for the Confederacy in the Union. And 
very early on in April and May of 1861. So just to give a sense of how early this is in the Civil War, this is right after the the um, Confederate firing on Fort Sumter when the war officially began. But this is well before the first Battle of Bull Run in July of 1861. So what I'm about to describe is happening long before anybody realized just how long and deadly the Civil War was going to be, because it wasn't until the first Battle of Bull Run, which the Confederates won unexpectedly, that um, that this reality really set in, that this was not going to be a quick and easy Union victory, and it was going to be a, a long, difficult war. So in April and May of 1861, there were a couple of very high-level meetings. One was in Richmond, the Confederate capital, and one was in Washington, D.C., the Union capital. And the meeting in Richmond involved Robert Toombs, Secretary of State, and the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. And they were plotting strategies at the beginning of the Civil War for a Confederate uh, version of westward expansion um, and the idea of, of building a Confederate empire to the Pacific uh, that would go through New Mexico territory and, in their minds, also northwestern Mexico through the states of Chihuahua and Sonora. In effect, they were looking at expanding the Texas boundary much further westward to uh, enlarge the Confederacy and to give the Confederacy uh, seaports on the Pacific Ocean. And here you see Robert Toombs saying the Confederate states must cultivate the most amicable relations with Mexico. And again, this is the very beginning of the Civil War. The fact that the Confederates would be thinking in such terms is, is, is really quite surprising. Um, now, at the same time, the Confederates were also thinking about Europe and establishing diplomatic relations with, uh, in particular, England and France and hoping to gain formal diplomatic recognition. But at the same time, they're also very seriously looking towards Mexico. And the second quote from Toombs on the right is indicative of some of the thinking um, on the southern side with respect to how they might cultivate these friendly relations with Mexico. Toombs here says the institution of domestic slavery in one country and that of peonage in the other establish a similarity in institutions. So what Toombs is saying is that, well, they have slavery in New Mexico and we have slavery in the South. There are different forms of slavery. They have debt peonage in New Mexico. We have uh, black chattel slavery in the South. But nonetheless, we all have slavery. So maybe that can be the foundation for building some form of alliance between the two regions. So at, at the same time, Abraham Lincoln is meeting with William Seward, and they are also looking at Mexico. And here you see you know, directly from Abraham Lincoln, be just, liberal, frank, and magnanimous towards Mexico. It can never be an enemy. So Lincoln is already thinking in terms of, of maintaining, uh, of establishing and maintaining friendly relations with, uh, with Mexico, in part to prevent the Confederacy from doing the same thing. So much of what the Union was doing in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands during the Civil War was aimed at sabotaging or otherwise preventing the Confederates from achieving any kind of foothold in the region or from forming any diplomatic alliances with Mexico. And then at the same time, William Seward, the mission to Mexico will be the most interesting and important one within our whole circle of international relations. And he's Mexico in 1861 to um, to reach out to the Mexican government and President Benito Juarez. That's what he's referring to as, as the mission to Mexico here. But again, the fact that Lincoln and Seward at the beginning of the Civil War are viewing their relation with Mexico as the most important in all of the in all of America's international relations is really quite striking here. And it says a lot about the importance of Mexico uh, as the Civil War uh, was, was getting underway. I have one more slide here with respect to this kind of background on, uh, on, on Mexican diplomacy, and then I'm going to pivot into, um, into some very specific Southwestern um, events. These are the two diplomats that, um, that the Union and the Confederacy sent to Mexico City in May of 1861. On the left, you see Thomas Corwin, who I just referred to, um, when William Henry Seward said that his mission to Mexico would be the most important in the Union's international relations. 
Uh, Corwin did succeed in um, uh, you know, establishing and maintaining relations with the, the Mexican government, and Corwin would remain in Mexico City for, uh, throughout much of the Civil War, uh, consistently sending correspondence back to Washington, D.C. on the course of events in Mexico, um, which included at that time from 1862 onward, the French in invasion of Mexico and a war between France and Mexico. Um, but on the right is John Pickett. And that's the person that the Confederacy sent to Mexico City in May of 1861. He proved to be far less effective as a diplomat. And actually, um, as we'll see in a, in a short while with Colonel James Riley, um, the Confederacy had a habit of choosing very, very uh, poor individuals to be their diplomats. This was true not just with Mexico, but also with Europe. Um, the Confederacy's diplomatic outreach to foreign nations failed miserably throughout the Civil War. And there are many reasons for that. But one reason is that they just picked terrible people as their diplomats. John Pickett was chosen to go to Mexico City. Uh, and the mission was to attempt to establish formal diplomatic relations with the Mexican government in 1861 and to extract formal recognition of Confederate independence. Uh, the, the hope was that Mexico would recognize the Confederate States of America as an independent nation separate from the United States, and that if Mexico recognized the Confederacy, then other foreign nations might, soon, uh, might follow suit. And this was really seen as pivotal from a Confederate perspective in establishing uh, their, um, uh, what they saw as their nationhood. Of course, the United States never recognized uh, Confederate nationhood or independence, but the Confederates were very interested in, in um, attaining diplomatic recognition abroad. Uh, Pickett was chosen for this post because he had previously been to Mexico. Um, I say that sort of laughingly because it's hard to believe that it's true, but, but literally his qualifications were that he had visited Veracruz for a couple of weeks in the 1850s. And his familiarity therefore with, uh, with Mexico um, made him qualified for the position of a diplomat to Mexico City. So Pickett gets to Mexico City and he is unable to secure a meeting with the president, with President Juarez. Um, he's pretty much sort of ignored by, um, by Mexican politicians. He offends a bunch, uh, numerous of them. Uh, he's, he's very openly racist towards the Mexican people. He makes a lot of comments to Mexican dignitaries that offend them. And, uh, and not long after he gets to Mexico City, he gets arrested. He was in a bar and uh, and drunk in a bar. He beat up a union sympathizer in Mexico City and was arrested for um, uh, for disturbing the peace, for fighting. And he then attempted to claim diplomatic immunity to avoid being put in jail. Uh, this failed because the Confederates did not recognize Confederate independence. So therefore, he had no diplomatic immunity. He was put in jail. He ended up bribing his way out of jail snuck his way from Mexico City a couple hundred miles to the port at Veracruz, snuck onto a ship and made his way back to Virginia and spent the rest of the Civil War trying to convince the Confederate government to reimburse him for his bribe money that he lost getting out of jail in Mexico City. And that is quite literally the extent of the Confederacy's formal diplomatic outreach to Mexico during the Civil War, the attempt to establish relations with, uh, with the Mexican national government in Mexico City. Uh, from that point forward, because this attempt failed, the Confederacy fell back throughout the rest of the Civil War on a wide range of irregular diplomacy. I, call it, I, I refer to it in the book as irregular diplomacy. Um, this typically involved independent scheming. This typically involved independent scheming by Confederate military officers and uh, Confederate officials in Texas and other Southern sympathizers in the borderlands who would make their way into Northern Mexico and attempt to, to make various types of, of deals, um, sort of under the table diplomatic arrangements with Mexican governors in the Northern borderlands. And this is not the way that diplomacy is supposed to be conducted. Diplomacy is, traditional diplomacy is conducted at the level of the nation state through the state departments. Um, and a, a local level um, 
official or politician or even a state governor would not be conducting formal international diplomacy or negotiating treaties. In reality, this would be a form of treason. Um, you know, for example, the type of, of scheming that was going on in the borderlands during the Civil War involved governors on both sides, governors in Texas and uh, um, territorial governors in New Mexico and, and California, and then Mexican state governors basically agreeing and creating treaties with one another that were never approved um, by their national governments. And, and, you know, this would be unheard of today. You know, this would be, uh, for comparative purposes, this would be as though, um, I mean, I live in Texas, so as though Governor Greg Abbott here in Texas met independently with the governors of, say, Coahuila or Nuevo León or Tamaulipas, and the two, he and those governors independently uh, agreed to a treaty between their states that completely omitted the nations of which they are a part, the U.S. and Mexico. It would be tantamount to treason, and this type of thing just wouldn't be done. But in the context of the Civil War, this is what was done quite frequently, especially from the Confederate side, because as I said, they had, uh, you know, their attempt to establish formal diplomatic relations failed at the outset with respect to Mexico. And really what enabled this to occur during the Civil War um, was the fact that in Mexico, most of the state governors, in, and this was uh, Sonora, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo León, Tamaulipas, those state governors in, men, in most cases were, were willing to act independently of their own government um, in ways that were sort of um, self-interested. And, and in most cases, these governors were attempting to capitalize on and profit from the American Civil War that was going on to their north in the United States. And part of the reason why these Mexican governors were able and willing to, to act in a sort of a, a quasi-independent way with respect to Confederate relations is that the Mexican government was, was severely weakened during this time and didn't have the ability to really enforce its power and control um, in the northern parts of the country along the U.S.-Mexico border. Part of that owed to the fact that the French invaded Mexico in 1862, and Mexico, uh, the Benito Juarez government of Mexico, was, was busy fighting a French invasion and simply couldn't really do anything to control the activities of, uh, of, of, of the governors in the northern states. So the Confederates were able to take advantage of that, of the turmoil that was occurring in Mexico as part of the French intervention, and Mexican governors along the border were able to take advantage of the turmoil that was occurring in the United States as part of the American Civil War. So in this way, the American Civil War and the French intervention in Mexico were really mutually reinforcing, and they gave rise to this borderlands environment that enabled a wide array, literally dozens of different individual actors um, during the Civil War to, to really engage in, in, in various types of scheming, uh, intrigue, smuggling, um, illegal activity, illicit activity, um, and, and, and and this really made Mexico, it, it drew Mexico into the American Civil War uh, for strategic purposes from the American standpoint. So I'd like to move now to a, a more specific look at what was going on in southern New Mexico and northwestern Mexico as an example of what I've been describing here with respect to uh, to this sort of irregular diplomacy and independent scheming in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. So on this slide, I have a, um, a map showing the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, the entire border from Texas to California. Um, and specifically, the map shows the route that General Henry Hopkins Sibley and his Confederate Army took in 1861 from San Antonio to El Paso and then up through Albuquerque and Santa Fe uh, as part of the Confederate invasion of New Mexico. Now this event is, is very well known and I'm not gonna talk much about it here today. Um, this is, uh, many, many books have been written about this Confederate invasion. Ultimately the Confederates were defeated at the Battle of Glorieta east of Santa Fe and retreated all the way back to Texas in um, uh, in April and, and May of 1862, and that was um, you know, sort of the culminating event in this Confederate attempt to expand their boundaries westward and to take control of New Mexico territory. 
But what I'd like to focus on instead is a subsidiary component of that Confederate campaign that is much lesser known. And that involves the, the person who you see on the upper right, who is Colonel James Riley, and a diplomatic mission that he was sent on in January and February of 1862 as part of Sibley's invasion of New Mexico. And Sibley, you see on the bottom right there in his, um, in his Confederate general's uniform. Colonel Riley was the second highest ranking officer in uh, in the Sibley Brigade during this invasion of New Mexico. Uh, Riley was chosen as the Confederate envoy to Chihuahua and Sonora. Um, again, not for very good reasons, much like Pickett. Um, Riley's diplomatic experience with respect to Mexico was that he had previously visited Spain and he was and 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 the confederate um you know there's there's a, a letter a correspondence where one of the confederate officers is describing that you know colonel colonel riley has been to spain and his familiarity with the spanish-speaking country makes him suitable for a diplomat to mexico so um there again much like a, much like pickett just you know the choice of diplomats here is you know is quite poor and and the basis for that choice is is you know, not is quite illegitimate. Uh, now, Riley did have a very short period of real diplomatic experience before the Civil War, but even that is, you know, again rises to the level of comical. Uh, Riley, in the late 1850s, was appointed as the U.S. Minister to Russia, and so Riley was originally from Texas, um, you know, pro-slavery Texas. Uh, he'd been a politician in Texas. Riley after being appointed to, uh, as a diplomat to Russia, um, he gets to St. Petersburg. And after two weeks, he resigns his position as diplomat, just two weeks. And he writes a letter back to the State Department in Washington, DC, explaining that the reason for his resignation is that it's too cold in Russia. So um, the Russian climate was, uh, um, was not suited to a, um, to a Texas native who was used to the, the warm, Humid weather, but there again, I mean, this just really gets back to my point about the, um, you know, the the poor choice of uh, of Confederate diplomats during the Civil War. Nonetheless, Riley is detached from the Sibley Brigade in February of 1862 after they reach El Paso in the Mesilla Valley of southern New Mexico. So Sibley and his troops are going to, in February, continue their march northward up the Rio Grande. Uh, eventually, uh, the Battle of Valverde in February of 1862, they continue north and, and fight the Battle of Glorieta in March of 1862. The entire time that the Sibley Brigade is moving up the Rio Grande and fighting the battles at Valverde and, uh, and Glorieta, Colonel Riley is in Chihuahua and Sonora on his secret diplomatic mission. And that mission was to uh, to reach out to and have personal meetings with the two uh, individuals who you see on the left-hand side of the screen. On the upper left, that's Ignacio Pesquera. He was the governor of Sonora. And on the bottom left is Luis Terrazas, and he was the governor of Chihuahua. So Riley is going to, uh, over the course of a couple of months in, uh, in 1862, he's traveling throughout northern Mexico. He goes to Ciudad Chihuahua. He meets with Terrazas. And he attempts to form a, an alliance between the Confederacy and the state of Chihuahua. Um, not the Confederacy and the country of Mexico, but the state of Chihuahua. And he, his pitch to Terrazas is that, um, for one thing, the Confederates need supplies to help sustain their, um, their invasion into New Mexico. And so... One of his his uh, his pitches to Terrazas is that the Confederate government will purchase supplies, especially food um, that's grown in Chihuahua from uh, from Terrazas and uh, and the local government there. So there's a financial benefit potentially to uh, to Governor Terrazas. And his other pitch is that uh, the, conf the Riley was hoping that Terrazas would agree to allow Confederate troops to operate on Mexican soil in Chihuahua. And he was also hoping that Terrazas might secede from Mexico and join the state of Chihuahua to the Confederacy. 
And his one of his pitches to, to Terrazas in hopes of convincing him to do this was that the Confederate army, if able to operate in Chihuahua, could help the Mexicans fight the Apaches. There was a shared enemy um, in the uh, in the Chiricahua Apaches. Uh, and so Riley was attempting to capitalize on this shared enemy for purposes of arranging a diplomatic alliance with the governor of Chihuahua. Ultimately, Terrazas refused to allow uh, to, uh, any of these concessions with the exception of uh, he did agree to sell supplies, mainly food, to the Confederate Army in New Mexico. But even then, he said that um, all um, all business transactions had to be conducted through a neutral third party, and he refused to even deal directly in any way with the Confederate uh, Army or the Confederate government. And his reasoning for this was that the Mexican government had formally declared neutrality in the U.S. Civil War, and if he dealt directly with the Confederates in such a way, he would be contradicting his nation's formal declaration of neutrality. So in reality, Terrazas turned out not to be the um, sort of the secessionist, treasonous individual that the Confederates had hoped that he would be. And he instead remained very much loyal to the Mexican government, but he still found, found a way through neutral, uh, through third parties to make money off of the American Civil War by selling supplies to the Confederates. Nonetheless, despite the fact that Terrazas essentially refused all of Riley's offers, Riley wrote a letter back to the Confederate government congratulating them on having achieved the first recognition, the first foreign recognition of the Confederate States of America. And this was uh, a, essentially a complete lie. And, and Riley's basis for this statement was that simply by having met with him in person in Chihuahua City, Governor Terrazas had by, by extension, by default, recognized the Confederate States of America. Um, of course, that really was not the case, but that's what Riley claimed in his letter. From Chihuahua, Riley then proceeded further westward to Sonora, to the, uh, to the capital there of, uh, of Udes, to meet with Governor Ignacio Pesquera. And again, he made the same sort of diplomatic overtures to, uh, to Governor Pesquera, uh, shared Apache enemy, hoping to get uh, uh, permission for Confederate troops to operate on Mexican soil. And the real reason that, that Riley wanted permission for Confederates to, uh, to operate in Mexico was not to fight Apaches, but rather to, um, to be able to move troops sort of strategically through parts of Mexico if needed, and the ultimate goal here was to land supplies at the uh, the port of, of Guaymas on the Sonoran coastline. And, and the, if they were able to land supplies there, the Confederates could then transport them overland to, to help sustain Sibley's army in New Mexico. So there are really ulterior motives at play here, but Riley was attempting to use the, the shared threat of Apache raiding as a pretense for an alliance. Once again, um, Governor Pesquera really sort of echoes what Terrazas had said um, during his meeting with Riley. He refused to form any sort of, uh, of alliance or agreement with the Confederates, and um, uh, he, he did not grant permission for Confederate troops to operate through Sonora or to use the port at Guaymas. Um, but again, if you look at the map here, you can see that if Riley had been successful and if the governors of Chihuahua and Sonora had if he had convinced them to commit treason and to secede from Mexico and join the Confederacy, all of the sudden, the Confederate border would have stretched all the way to the Gulf of California, which was really the Pacific Ocean. Right? It would have expanded the Texas boundary all the way to the Pacific, and this would have had significant strategic and logistical implications for the American Civil War. It would have given the Confederacy an outlet on the Pacific um, and, uh, and, and and expanded Confederate boundaries. And if you were to couple this with New Mexico territory, which of course Sibley's objective in invading New Mexico was to take control of it and to make it part of the Confederacy, this would have dramatically expanded Confederate boundaries. And it would have also given them a pathway to California, which was the ultimate goal here. This is why my book is entitled Illusions of Empire. The Confederates had an illusion 
of a Pacific empire that stretched from the Old South and from Texas all the way to California um, and, and would have made the Confederacy a, a transcontinental nation or, or empire. And it was you know, very much illusory. Uh, they, they never achieved any of this, but they did try uh, in 1861 and 62 through these campaigns into the Southwest borderlands. Ultimately, when, uh, when Riley, Riley's gonna depart um, from Sonora and he's gonna rejoin Sibley's brigade at, um, uh, in the Mesilla Valley in around April, April to May of 1862 as they were retreating from New Mexico after they had uh, been defeated at the Battle of Glorieta. At the same time that Riley was, was operating in, um, uh, in Northwestern Mexico, the the Union operatives in California were 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 attempting to sabotage those efforts. And here on my final slide, uh, before I talk about um, about the California officers and and uh, and their role in all of this, I have a, a few more quotes here. This sort of illustrate the thinking behind um, uh, behind these operations. So in the upper left, um, Henry Hopkins Sibley, commanding the Sibley Brigade, when he reaches New Mexico in, um, in 1861, he, uh, he gives a speech um, to the, the population at Mesilla and, um, and basically declares southern New Mexico part of the Confederacy by virtue of military occupation. And he's, he's outlining this illusion of empire that I'm referring to. He's saying you know, by geographical position, by similarity of institutions, by commercial interests, and by future destinies, New Mexico pertains to the Confederacy. So geographical position, he's saying that New Mexico is a natural extension of Texas and, and, and ought to be part of the Confederacy. Similarity of institutions, he's echoing the Confederate Secretary of State Robert Toombs in referencing slavery. He's saying that there are forms of slavery in both of these places, and therefore they have something in common, and it would make sense for them to be one and the same um, in terms of, of being part of the Confederate States of America and by future destinies. So this is in a lot of ways is, is sort of like a, a Confederate version of a manifest destiny with respect to the Southwest borderlands and the Pacific world. And here you have James Riley in January of 1862 as he is departing on his mission into Chihuahua and Sonora. Uh, and this really just epitomizes how Confederates looked at um, uh, at the Southwest in terms of their Civil War strategy, and they placed very high importance on this. Riley says, we must have Chihuahua and Sonora. With Chihuahua and Sonora, we gain Southern California and render our state of Texas the great highway of nations. And in response to this, here you have the New York Times in, uh, in May of 1862, saying rather um, uh, sarcastically, the Confederates are playing fine games in that distracted country, referring to, um, to Southern New Mexico and um, the, the Southwest borderlands. And finally here, um, and, and this will segue into, uh, into California's role in this, George Wright was the, uh, the Union commander of the uh, military department of California during the, um, the early Civil War period. And this is a letter that he's writing to Sonora Governor Ignacio Pesquera after Pesquera met with Riley in March of 1862. And this is Union General Wright very threateningly telling, telling the Sonora governor that if you make any kind of a deal with the Confederates, if you cooperate with them, we will destroy your state. Uh, we will destroy Mexico. And Wright went on, General Wright went on there. Um, I didn't have uh, the rest of his quote there, but he actually threatened to send 10,000 Union troops into Sonora to fight the Confederates in Mexico if necessary and to, um, and, and to eliminate Governor Pesquera from, uh, from, his, you know, from political control in the region. So there's an irony in this because the Confederates were sent Riley as a as a sort of a secret diplomatic envoy into northwestern Mexico, trying to cut a deal with them, um, and at the but and he failed and he left. He, he departed Mexico and and no Confederate troops were ever sent into northern uh, northwestern Mexico. 
And then you have Union officers, uh, George Wright in California, and also General James Henry Carleton, who was stationed in Santa Fe and um, was commanding the, uh, <clears throat> the the Union Military Department of New Mexico. Both of those, both Carleton and Wright, sent really a barrage of threatening letters to, uh, to Terrazas and Pesqueda in Mexico, telling them, if you cooperate in any way with these Confederate, uh, with the Confederates, we're going to send a massive army down there and, uh, and, 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 and kick you out of power and, and just take control of Chihuahua and Sonora ourself until the Civil War ends, just to make sure that the Confederates don't get it. So the irony there is that you know, these Union commanders were telling the Mexican governors, oh, the Confederates, they just want to take control of your territory. They want to they want to take possession of Chihuahua and Sonora. They want to they want to take power from you and you better not cut a deal with them. But in reality, the most severe threats of military force were coming from these union officers in California and New Mexico um, who, who were threatening to invade Mexico with their armies. And in, in the case of, of, of General Wright and General Carleton, Unlike the Confederates under Sibley, the Union officers in New Mexico, they actually had the military ability. They had enough men and they had the capability to, to actually invade Mexico. And the Confederate army was quite small, only about 3,000 men, and, and they would not have been able to really um, you know, achieve much had, uh, had Sibley's um, Confederates really you know, attempted to assert their, their will in Chihuahua and Sonora. And that's also indicative of the approach they took. Uh, you know, when Sibley invaded New Mexico, he had only about 3,000 men, and he was he had his hands full fighting the Union troops in New Mexico. Sibley didn't have the ability, in terms of military manpower, to um, to force his will onto the Mexican governors in Chihuahua and Sonora. Otherwise, he very well might have done so. If Sibley had had 20 or 30,000 men at his disposal, he very easily could have sent half of them into Mexico. And, um, and and tried to take control of, of northwestern Mexico by force, but Sibley and Riley recognized their own military weakness and that they you know there was no way that they could do this, and uh, and, and so they didn't even try. They tried a, a very sort of secretive, under the table diplomatic approach with Colonel Riley's mission that that ultimately failed. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, you know, in California and New Mexico, there were significant numbers of Union troops who um, uh, who could have you know, if they'd been ordered to do so, gone into northwestern Mexico and, and uh, occupied the region for the duration of the Civil War. So this is really, you know, one, one of many examples that I write about in my book of the ways in which Civil War operatives on both the Union and the Confederate sides attempted to manipulate the course of events in the Southwest borderlands and, and in particular attempted to, to formulate sort of very unconventional types of alliances with, um, with foreign officials. And in this particular case, state governors rather than national officials. And they saw this both union and Confederate operatives, they saw this as really central to their overall strategies in the civil war, which again, going back to, to, to bring this full circle, uh, with how I began, that really says a lot about how American operatives, both in Richmond and Washington, D.C., uh, were looking at Mexico at the beginning of the Civil War. And, you know, in, when, when, again, you know, most, most historians and, and anybody who thinks about the Civil War, Mexico doesn't usually come to mind. Most people would never even think that, that Mexico could possibly have played any important role in the Civil War or that it had any role at all. And of course, you know, Mexico didn't have a direct fighting role. Mexico never sent troops to fight in the American Civil War. They, they remained neutral officially throughout the Civil War. And yet Mexico could, throughout the war was really kind of seen as a pawn by Union and Confederate um, uh, operatives. And, and a lot of that had to do with Mexico's geographic position right next to the United States and next to Texas. Mexico was the only foreign country that bordered the Confederacy. So it stands to reason um, that, you know, the Confederates would, for strategic purposes, look at Mexico in, in, in certain ways that they thought might benefit their war effort. And as far as northwestern Mexico, Chihuahua and Sonora is concerned, and, and you know, in the American Southwest, uh, New Mexico Territory, 
this really involved the this Confederate illusion of empire, this belief that that uh, the Confederacy might somehow convince two Mexican governors to um, uh, to go rogue, to disavow their um, you know their their obligations, their responsibilities, their nationality um, or nationalism, I should say, um, to Mexico and to commit treason, to secede from Mexico, and to throw their states um, into the Confederacy in a way that would expand the Confederate border to the Pacific, and um, and and in, in so doing, really. Uh, have significant strategic implications for the course of the American Civil War. Does this mean that um, that the Civil War would have ended differently? No, absolutely not. Um, this certainly is not uh, an argument that, um, uh, well, the South could have won the Civil War if only uh, those two governors had of had have joined the Confederacy. That's absolutely not uh, not what I'm saying. And and in reality, even if the um, even if those two governors had of cooperated with with the Confederates under Colonel Riley, the Confederates did not have the military or political or economic capabilities to really sustain a a transcontinental empire at that point. And of course, as I said, you know the Union had large numbers of troops nearby in California and New Mexico that would have um, you know. Uh, would have undone any type of alliance that uh, that the Confederates might have formulated. So it really was just sort of daydreaming uh, and and uh, wishful thinking on the part of the Confederates, and and it would not have have materially changed the outcome of the Civil War. Um, it might have it, it it would have had some immediate implications for the invasion of New Mexico. You know, the Confederates might have been able to you know to to get more supplies to have. Have maybe prolonged their operation into New Mexico, uh, but even then, uh, would they would not have been able to sustain that operation. But really, the point I want to make here is is not that this would have changed the outcome of the Civil War, but that Confederate and Union officials during the Civil War believed it could have impacted the outcome of the Civil War, and because they believed that that it could have affected the Civil War they behaved accordingly. They put very high levels of importance on these operations that were occurring thousands of miles away from uh, from Gettysburg and, uh, and Antietam and Fredericksburg and from these main theaters of battle in the American Civil War. And that's really illustrated again, I would just go back to, to the quotes from Abraham Lincoln, um, uh, William Seward, you know, our relations with Mexico are the most important uh, uh, for the country at this point. And, um, you know, so so I think it's really important to think about the these events in these southwest borderlands, New Mexico, northern Mexico, not in the sense that the that this could have changed the outcome of the Civil War, but that it did nonetheless play an important role in the Civil War because those who were really calling the shots, those who were in power in on in both the, the Union and the Confederacy, really put a lot of, of, uh, of significance on these events and acted accordingly. So I, I would um, I would just conclude with that point, uh, you know, and, uh, and and really just sort of reiterating the way in which this demonstrates Mexico's role in the American Civil War um, that is 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 largely if not unknown, uh, at least largely unrecognized and underappreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Billy, for once again sharing your analysis and insights on the lesser known aspects of Union, Confederate, and Mexican interaction along the U.S.-Mexican border, particularly uh, the border uh, with the New Mexico territory, during the early days of, uh, of the American Civil War. We we really benefit from from your from your uh, ability to put this in the all of these interactions in the context of 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 the broader context of the Civil War. This is a lesser known area, uh, one that has not been studied in great detail, uh, and uh, you certainly bring bring uh, uh, notable insights uh, uh, into that. Um, the uh, 
I, uh, you know, of course, with, with struck, you know, there so many of the activities were around in terms of not surprisingly, um, the uh, uh, Confederate invasion of New Mexico and the consequences of the failure of that. Um, the similar, the parallels in terms of the opportunities that the Confederates uh, wanted to believe were available in terms of access of territory, which would again provide them with an with this with an additional uh, link or uh, or a link, um, depending upon circumstances, um, with uh, California and with the Pacific Coast. I think really comes across here, as we know there was uh, you know Sibley argued very strong, uh, you know made note of the fact that if he had won in 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 New Mexico that would have been uh, opened the door for them to advance into Colorado and then westward into California um, as 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 another route to expand uh, confederate confederate territory um i was curious that uh of course we had the efforts of the new mexicans um uh, in the south uh, they uh, had two um uh, con conventions and together they established a confederate uh, territory of arizona uh with that uh and i understand i believe it was based in their their um the center of their government uh, uh in the in the short period that it existed was in Mesilla. i'm i'm wondering if uh if there was any action on the part of those individuals or um uh, to to inter also to interact with uh um the uh uh the uh, with with northern um, mexico and, and those provinces yeah so the confederate territory of arizona was established uh, august 1st 1861 when uh, lieutenant colonel john robert baylor arrived there ahead of the sibley brigade several months ahead um and now the the union of course never recognized the existence of the confederate territory of arizona it was just it was recognized by the confederate congress and uh and really only existed for a few months once the confederates retreated in and arrived back in texas in may of 1862 for all intents and purposes that confederate territory of arizona ceased to exist and and really it was it was really I think another example of sort of a Confederate illusion of empire that they established such a territory in the first place. Uh, it was you know, not something that the Confederates ever really had much control over this. You know, they, they were, they, they drew a line on a map. They basically cut New Mexico territory in half horizontally up near where Socorro would be and drew a line all the way from Texas to California and said that the bottom half of that line was confederate territory and, and and they named it arizona um they had no real claim to that other than you know having occupied Mesilla, which they they made their capital but even within that within the boundaries of that confederate territory of arizona there were you know u.s troops at fort craig for example um south of socorro um many of the people living in in the region that was the confederate territory of arizona were Southern sympathizers. There were a lot of Southern sympathizers in Mesilla um, and also in some of the mining towns, uh, Pinos Altos uh, near Silver City, for example. Uh, but it was a very sparsely populated region. Um, and to the extent that those living in, in that region played any role in the uh, in affairs with Mexico, as I've been talking about today with Chihuahua and Sonora, um, they actually undermined and sabotaged uh, Colonel Riley's efforts. Um, and the the best example of this is in uh, in February and in, in March of 1862, uh, Sibley and most of the Confederate Army had already marched northward um, up, um, up towards Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And they left behind just a small occupational force in the Mesilla Valley. And um, and one of the officers there was was Baylor, who had remained behind. And um, in February of '62, Baylor uh, he uh, this ended up being a, a major controversy with the um, with Mexican officials. Uh, Baylor led a small group of Confederate soldiers into northern Mexico, into Chihuahua, to uh, to conduct a surprise attack on an Apache camp uh, near Coralitos. And, um, and Baylor 
uh, the Apaches had been attacking Confederate um, picket camps all up and down the river um, during their their operation into New Mexico. Uh, Baylor um, was was well known as a uh, he had, he had been an Indian fighter in Texas. He had been a Texas Ranger at one point. Was um, uh, was not shy about his hatred for Indians, in particular Apaches. And um, you know, so so Baylor led a small group of Confederate troops into Mexico, which is a direct violation of Mexican sovereignty, uh, and the only t- example of Confederate soldiers actually entering Mexico during any of these events I've described today, with the exception of Riley, uh, who who went by himself essentially. Um, he had a Mexican escort that met him at the border and took him into Mexico so that it wasn't viewed as an armed invasion. Uh, but Baylor rode into Mexico, uh, ambushed uh, an Apache camp, killed several Apaches, and as quick as he could, rode back into uh, uh, into Mesilla, in the Confederate territory of Arizona. And uh, and this this outraged Mexican officials. Uh, the governor, Governor Terrazas, who had just met with Colonel Riley, um, was was livid about this. And uh, and he actually wrote letters uh, directly to um, to the Confederate government in Richmond, complaining about this violation of sovereignty. Um, Jeff Davis apologized profusely that Baylor had done this because Davis was afraid that this would sabotage these diplomatic efforts. You know, he's got Riley down in Mexico trying to grease the wheels of of irregular diplomacy to cut these types of secret deals. And then at the same time, he has this rogue officer uh, leading troops down into Mexico to fight Apaches without Mexican uh, the governor's permission. Uh, And, you know, so it really caused a a pretty serious international incident. Um, And and uh, and there again is is an example of of the, the ways in which different Confederate operatives. It really fits into what I've called independent scheming. You know, uh, Baylor's idea was that you know he was going to go kill Apaches because the Apaches were uh, were undermining his efforts, uh, the Confederate efforts in New Mexico, by attacking their picket camps and stealing their horses. And he didn't care if he you know made the Mexican Mexicans mad or not by going into Mexico. Um, and he was just going to do what he wanted to do, you know, independently. While Riley, of course, is then meeting with the governors a- in Mexico, and then you know so. You know, it's, it's really illustrative of, of just of the ways in which this borderlands environment, this this really fits perfectly with the definition of borderlands as a, a place where no single entity, whether it's a nation or a state or a, a, a government official or an independent actor, nobody has complete power and control. And At the same time, many different groups and uh, nations and states and peoples are competing for power and control in that borderlands region. And you really see that playing out here uh, with these events in northwestern Mexico and and, uh, in New Mexico territory. Uh, Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Overall, I want to just thank you for the for the uh, your informative analysis and the complexity of U.S. local and national interactions as well as the innumerable Confederate initiatives, um, formal and informal, um, into, uh, with toward Mexico and its border provinces, and how they all relate, again, to the American Civil War, as we mentioned, uh, as, as becomes patently clear. Um, if Do you have any last-minute thoughts uh, at this point, or would you, uh, and then we can say farewell? Um, you know, I just, uh, just want to thank you once again for reaching out to me and for the invitation, um, you know, to, uh, to speak here about my book and, and to share some of these, um, these historical events with, um, with you all. And, uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity. And, and if any, if there are any questions, um, you know, uh, anybody is free to reach out to me via email. Uh, and in that vein for our audience, uh, sh- should you have any questions, Feel free to use the chat uh, below the uh, this recording, and uh, we will be sure to uh, share those with uh, Billy and um, uh, uh, address address them as the, as as they arise. Uh, so, um, uh, so 
Thank you very much, Billy. I'm really, really glad you were able to join us again. It's always a pleasure uh, to, to, to have you um, uh, speak uh, on behalf of the, friend, uh, the Friends of History and share your, your extensive knowledge uh, of the borderlands. Thank you. If you'd like to purchase Billy's book, Illusions of Empire, it is available through the University of Pennsylvania uh, Press web page, which you can see here. In closing, a reminder to all to check out the Friends of History web page, which is shown below, where you can again watch this lecture as well as other First Wednesday lectures covering a wide range of historical topics about New Mexico. And do come back to the webpage to learn about our upcoming 2024 topics in the first Wednesday lecture series, and more broadly, to learn more about the Friends of History itself. You can join our mailing list either via the webpage or by emailing us uh, at nmhmfriendsofhistory at gmail.com. And finally, consider making a donation, however small, so that we can continue to provide these informative lectures throughout the year. We thank you for your past support and your future support. We look forward to seeing you all in the months ahead. Goodbye for now.